Welcome to the Momxiety Club podcast. I'm your host, Tori Levine, a former mental health worker with degrees in psychology and criminal justice, so I know the importance of keeping calm in a difficult situation. But when I had my kids, I found myself full of anxiety. One day, everything clicked and I made a commitment to own my anxiety so it doesn't own me. And that's why I started the Momxiety Club podcast. Each week, we'll discuss the ups, the downs, and anxieties of motherhood. So join me and let's get rid of this momxiety together. Welcome to episode 14 of the Momxiety Club podcast. On today's episode, you will hear my conversation with Lynn April that touches on so many different aspects of life and motherhood, infertility, postpartum anxiety, postpartum depression, differences in between perinatal mood disorders with her first and second child, as well as fitness and pelvic organ prolapse. Before we get started, I just want to thank you for listening. It would mean the world to me if you would reach out and connect with me on social media or via email. I love interacting and hearing from you, so send me a message just to say hi uh, or to share a milestone that your little one has achieved or something that you're struggling with right now in motherhood. You can reach me at Momxiety, M O M X I E T Y Club on Instagram and Facebook, or you can send me an email to Momxiety Club at gmail.com. Now, I wanted to just mention I was having some technical issues, so I created a Gmail account to make sure I am getting emails that are not being sent. Uh, properly through my hello at Momxiety Club email. So I apologize if you have sent me something there. Um, I'm just having some problems with it. Okay, if this is your first time listening to the podcast, know that if I reference anything in the episode, like articles, previous episodes, guest social media, or ways to work with me or become a member of the Momxiety Club membership, you can find a link to these in the show notes. So if you're driving, rocking baby to sleep, making dinner, or any of the other amazing multitasking mom superpowers that you're doing, you don't have to worry about taking a note or a mental note to remember to look it up later. Uh, Now, my problem is I can't remember to go back and then look in the show notes, but that I'm sorry, I can't help you with. I'm just trying to make it as easy for you to find the little things that you might want to look up from the episode. All right. Also a reminder to make sure you hit the subscribe button in wherever you listen to your podcasts. That way your busy mom brain doesn't have to remember one more thing. And the next episode will automatically show up on your phone or wherever you listen to podcasts. Today, I'm having a conversation with Lynn April, and I knew Lynn since elementary school. We were elementary and middle school together and have remained in touch on and off and through Facebook throughout the years. Lynn is a professional food blogger and recently became a certified personal trainer focusing on pre and postnatal fitness. She was an athlete in school and throughout college and remained active throughout the years and went to the gym through the entirety of both of her pregnancies. Lynn also struggled through infertility, postpartum depression, and anxiety. And if you're anything like me, even as I was listening back through to um, get the podcast ready for today, I'm just sitting here nodding my head and in my head going, yep, that's me too. Yep. Yep. So without further ado, here is my interview with Lynn April. Well, hello, Lynn. Thank you so much for joining me here on the Momxiety Club podcast. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me. I am so excited to talk about anxiety. Yes, (laughs) I know. (laughs) Isn't that, isn't that the thing we always want to talk about our anxiety? (laughs) Yeah. You know what though? I think that talking about it is so helpful because so many people have it and don't realize it or, you know, they, 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 they get it and they don't, they've never had it before. And they're like, what is, what is this? What's wrong with me? And man, the more you can recognize it, the better. Right. Absolutely. Very much. So 
I feel like we like just dove right into it, but tell us first yeah. about you, a little bit about you, and then we will talk about your postpartum story and anxiety. And um, you are one of the first people when this whole Momsiety Club idea was coming to fruition that when I was thinking, okay, these are the topics I want to cover. These are what I want to do. I can talk to these people. You were right up on there because you have always been so open and honest. And I really admire that about you. So thank you. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so I guess a little about me. Um, I am a full-time food blogger, um, as of a year ago. Uh, and I have two little boys, Joey is four and Johnny is two. And I also work as a personal trainer for pre and postnatal moms, um, at my husband's gym. So I kind of do a lot of things. Um, we also, we have some infertility in our history to get, um, pregnant with our first son, um, which I think is and I can get to that, why I think that's part of where my anxiety stems stemmed from postpartum. Um, what else did you ask me? <laughs> no, that was great. Yeah. <laughs> now we can just jump right in. Um, what, well, one of the other things too, is you've always said you were an athlete. So I think that that when you continue to tell your story a little bit, will show how you kind of cope with things as well. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I did want to say, you said that, um, I was on your mind because I, uh, I was so open about my journey. So when I sort of let the world know that we were struggling with infertility, um, I don't know what compelled me to do that, but it helped me so much in my healing and my eventual getting pregnant, um, because my speaking out got me into a community of women that was so supportive and still is so supportive to this day. And I think that, um, I felt obligated to the people who supported me to be so open about how we wanted this baby so bad. And I still got this overwhelming feeling of what am I doing? I can't do this. I, what have we done really? Like, why did we want this? And I felt that it was important to be open about that part of it. Um, because that part, it didn't sort of line up with like wanting a baby so bad. And I, for a little while, I thought something was wrong with me. And, um, which I think a lot of parents, a lot of moms do when they get to that point. Um, so yeah, I decided to be open about it and, and I have, I've gotten so much feedback and like, and people like you who said like, I've thought of you because I know somebody who's going through this or I'm going through it myself. And I'm so glad that I have you to talk to about this. So yeah, I'm so glad that you are doing this because we, we, we say these things all the time. Like we don't talk mm -hmm. about this stuff. We don't talk about this stuff enough. And like, I feel like you can't talk about it enough. Right. You, you can't. And you, uh, Again, you, I admire because you are gifted with your words, whereas I'm a blabbering idiot. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I think I always look to you and go, oh, she said it perfectly. Like nobody could have put it more like those are all the things I'm feeling. And I know from just your posts that that is what everybody who sees them feels like you put exactly what we were feeling into this. And that's why I love this venue right now and getting to talk to moms like you and you sharing your experience because yes, you are then are going to be in the listener's ear in mom's ear saying, this is what's happening to me. And I know I needed that when I was, um, really in the thick of postpartum anxiety and everything. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, absolutely. And that is another, what you said, what have we done? Um, I've heard that through, from you, as well as some other people who've dealt with infertility, as well as not. Um, that is a very, very common thought. I think that every single mom has. Yes. So absolutely. And I think that the, what have we done <laughs> um, was so different the second time around because we knew what we were getting into the second time around, but it was more or less like, what have we done? to our family? What have we done? Why did we do this to our first one? Like we had such, 
we had such a rough time getting started and then you find your groove and like things change, but for the most part, you, it, it kind of, I feel like at least for me, once I healed from my anxiety, it was a little bit more smooth sailing. And then to just go and mess that up again, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, why did we do this? Things were so good. And, and it's so hard not to blame yourself. And I mean, now we're two, we're almost two and a half years into the two kids part. And man, there are some days where we're like, what have we done? But like in, le in a less of a, a regretful way and more like, oh my gosh, <laughs> right. why did we do this to ourselves like, um, kind of way? But man, yeah. they're best friends and they're, yeah, they fight, but oh, it, there are so many more positives now than there were in the beginning. <laughs> yes. um, so you mentioned the differences between the first and the second what about your anxiety postpartum and your just postpartum experience between uh, your first and your second? Did you see similarities there? A lot of differences? That's a really great question. And I think that this part of my personal story is so important because like I said, the first time around, we struggled through infertility. When I finally got pregnant, we were so happy and I, I, but I was a mess during my pregnancy emotionally. I was like, oh my gosh, we've worked so hard to get this baby. Like I, I I'm terrified to lose it. Um, all this kind of stuff. And I, and I kind of thought to myself, uh, I feel like you're setting yourself up for post postpartum mood or mood disorders. And so I was kind of on alert for it. Like, I feel like this might happen. I was talking to, you know, Matt, my husband about it and my friends like, Hey guys, I think this might happen to me. I just want everyone to like kind of be on alert and like keep track of me, keep, keep tabs on me. And I remember when Joey was born, when he came out, I expected to be overcome with joy and crying and so happy. And I wasn't, and it, but I wasn't, I wasn't upset. I was, I just, I was so distracted by the fact that he smelled so weird. <laughs> I remember that so vividly. And I was like, oh, this is gross. Like, what is this? What's happening? And I felt like, who is a stranger? And I don't know this child. And it was a very, it was a very bizarre experience only because I didn't, I think I, I thought it was going to be different in my head. I think everybody does because it's built up to this. Yeah, it is. It's built up to be this beautiful thing. And like it, it on some levels, yeah, it's beautiful. But on other levels, it's just like, it's weird and it's yeah. strange and I, I don't know. It, everybody's different, but that's how I felt. And you, I, no, sorry, I'm just going to no, ask another question. Okay. Were you induced or did you go into labor? Oh, I, that's a, you that's were a induced, question. right? I was, I was induced. Yeah. We had, Joey was, um, he had IUGR, which is intrauterine growth restriction. So I had low fluid. And so at 39 weeks in one day I was induced. Um, so yeah, it was kind of this like, okay, we're having a baby. Here we are. This is what's happening. And like, it was kind of just like when he came out, I was like, oh, okay, here he is. Um, now what? And I remember trying to nurse and like, I was looking down and like trying to hold his head. And I remember thinking like, what, is, what am I doing? This is so robotic and like weird. And like his mouth is so tiny and right. oh my gosh. So we went home and you know, adjusted to life. And he was a really screamy, non-sleepy baby at first. And for the first five days, I think I felt okay. And then I just sort of like, it was like a slow decline. Like I just, I was having trouble sleeping. I was not interested in eating. I couldn't even bring myself to brush my teeth. It was, it was really bad. And I, I remember my mom came to visit and it just, her being there was like bothering me. And I, and it was strange because I needed, I wanted the help, but it was annoying me to have the help. And I, and she, she said like, Lynn, I, uh, something's not right. And this was around the same time that Matt had kind of said something like, Oh, I don't think things are, things are okay. And at some point in there, I had told Matt, like, I didn't want, I didn't want to kill myself, but I didn't want to be there anymore. That's kind of how it was. It was like, I just don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to be here. I, I don't want this, this sucks. Right. Um, I've had that. So it, I want to run away. Like, yes, exactly. It was like, away. I just, and my mom actually came, Matt had to go away when Joey was like, uh, I, it was about three weeks 
in that I got, I started getting treatment for my postpartum anxiety, but right around that time, Matt had to go away for work. It was like this thing that we always knew he was going to do. My mom was going to come. My mom and I, I, she slept in my bed with me and in the middle of the night, I decided to get up and lay on the floor because I wasn't, I wasn't sleeping well in the bed and I just needed to be by myself. And she said she woke up, did not see me in the bed and looked out the window to make sure that I didn't like drive away because I, she was like, it was almost like you were, I was a flight risk. Like that, right? it, I, I was not good. I was not good. So I started with my midwife. I started to talk to her. Um, she got me set up with, uh, Zoloft and I also started seeing a talk therapist. Um, and within a couple weeks, I was starting to feel better and it was like night and day. Um, it was a pretty quick recovery. Um, I was, I stopped taking my Zoloft at five months postpartum, um, continued to see my therapist, I don't remember what frequency, but I, 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 I talked to her here and there and felt completely re- recovered and, and stuck my Zoloft at five months postpartum and, and, and had no issues then after that. Um, so then a second time came around and we, Johnny was a, a welcome surprise. Um, and I spent that pregnancy not worried, like so excited to be pregnant and like, Oh, this is going to be fine. Joey's going to have a little brother. This is going to be awesome. Blah, 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 blah. And it was funny because in the back of my mind, it was, I knew that I wasn't uh, completely safe from postpartum anxiety this time around, but I thought maybe this time will be different, but I wasn't completely for turning it off because I wasn't going to do that to myself and like completely sideline myself this time. So, um, felt great the whole time, went into labor on my own and had him very shortly after I started labor and he came out and it was that overwhelming, like, Oh man, I love this kid. He, he's so cute. And like, he nursed right away. And we just like had this, it was just perfect. It was like exactly what you see, you know, quote unquote, the perfect situation, like what you see in TV. Like it was Mm -hmm. just, it was great. And like, we were talking and laughing with the doctor and the anesthesiologist. And it was just so different. And I spent the first three weeks sleeping great and he was a great sleeper. So he, and I looking back on it he was an easy baby. And so it did completely sideline me when I woke up one day, completely incapable of being a mother to this baby. And it, I kind of felt it the night before going to sleep. I just kind of felt like my heart's a little bit racy. I I feel like I'm having trouble falling asleep. And I woke up the next day in like ready to crawl into a hole. And, and it was weird because the day before I was completely fine. And I did the same kind of thing. I, I got in contact with my OB. She immediately prescribed me Zoloft, which was nice because she had, she said to me in the delivery room, if you want Zoloft right now, I will give it to you. And I was like, Oh, let me just hold off. But I know like she gave me her phone number, text me if you need it. So that's what I did. I texted her that morning and said, I need Zoloft right now. She called me in a prescription. I had it in my system within hours. Um, I, I contacted my talk therapist again um, and she talked to me on the phone. It was a little bit harder to go see her at that point. Cause I had a toddler and a newborn. So we talked on the phone a little bit and I did eventually go in to see her, but, um, that recovery was so much harder. And I think it's because, I mean, you have a toddler that time, like, and it's just, there's a lot, you're splitting your attention, you're splitting your time, you're splitting your self care. And, it was just, it was just so much, it was, it was a lot harder the second time. Um, but the timeline was about the same, um, for when I felt completely recovered. Um, I stopped my medication closer to six months that time. Um, and I, I haven't, haven't really had any problems since then. COVID is a completely different conversation, <laughs> <laughs> but, but aside from the postpartum, um, issues that was, 
the recovery was longer, but it was around the same amount of time. And I think what's so important about those two experiences is that it's so obvious that this is my brain. This is my body. This is the way my, the chemicals in my, in my body work. Mm -hmm. And, and I didn't, I just, since I wasn't exactly expecting it the second time, I think it's just so much proof that like, no matter what I should probably not have a third baby. (laughs) So, and then, and honestly, that's part of the reason, like we are done, we're done having children. We've made sure of that. And, um, I think that if I wouldn't expect to get it another time and expect to want to strangle another child, like I would have another one, but I don't want to do that to myself. I don't want to do that to my family. And I, and I don't want to do that to my boys because Joey saw, and he was two when Johnny was born, but he still saw a lot of like my hiding in the closet and my just crying for no reason. And they start to pick up on that stuff. And like, now there's, there's a four-year-old and a two-year-old. And if I, if I had another baby right now, oh my gosh, there'd be so many questions about like, mommy, why are you so mad? Why do you, why do you, why are you yelling? And like, I just can't, I can't do it. We can't do it again. So yeah. Yeah. I remember actually, and, but we did do it. <laughs> was in between, yeah. it was probably about a year before the year before I got pregnant or a year before, um, he was born one or the other, but yeah, there was something happened close to home that was very, uh, emotional and like set me on this, like, oh my gosh, everything. So I was like depressed, anxious about a lot of things. And I remember having those same exact feelings of what I had after Ruben and saying, I don't ever want to feel like this again we can't. And it was like, I think it was when we were discussing having a second kid and I was like, I can't, like, I can't do it. And it was like, okay, there's, you don't have to, we don't have to, we can be perfectly fine with one or if it happens, you know, we can do it again. And yeah, (laughs) I did put myself through that. Yeah. Um, But it's interesting how you you were kind of like the reverse of how your um, anxiety came on as mine because mine, the second time went around, there was like that no connection. I was like, who is this strange Mm -hmm. child? Like, I don't have that right now. Mm -hmm. So it is very interesting how it doesn't happen the first time or it can happen. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that it's so, we put so much pressure on ourselves as moms to like be these perfect moms from the beginning. And like, it is so hard to forget that all your newborn needs is someone to feed it, someone to change it and someone to care for it. And I think that that it's really important to note that it only needs someone to care for it. And if you don't love your baby, you're not a bad mom because there, I, I did not love my newborns. (laughs) Mm -hmm. at all (laughs) not even like well I guess I loved Johnny when he first came out but like I don't know it's it it it's so much pressure to like oh I have to love this baby because it's my own and well maybe eventually you will love it but you don't have to like it right now and it's newborns are the worst (laughs) (laughs) they're really the worst (laughs) <laughs> I just talk to you and tell you what they need yeah right man I know and toddlers are so difficult like there's but they're a different kind of difficult and I say all the time like the newborns newborns suck they stay where you put them but toddlers <laughs> toddlers don't stay where you put them um and sometimes they irritate you but they at least tell you that they love you and can like give you hugs <laughs> The newborns just look at you. They're just a sack of eyes for, uh, for quite a while. <laughs> I love, yeah, that is great. And that's so funny. Cause I remember it, it must be my, in the chemicals in my brain, remembering like 
newborn Reuben was wonderful. It was amazing. And yeah, no, it was not. Definitely <laughs> it was not when I really think about it. But in my head, it was simple and easy. And I, I wish I could go back to those newborn times where he would just sit and sleep and I could just like relax. Yeah. Um, and it's child to child too. Cause mm-hmm. right now I go, I don't want to go back to the newborn with Eli. Not at <laughs> all. Mm-mm. Yeah, I know. And it, and it's so different right now. No, like we have almost exactly two years difference between our boys. It's 23 months. So same time of year, we have the same kind of like like right now we're dealing with the two last year we were dealing with an 18 month old, right. When the cold weather was coming and like, I despise the 18 month age, like 18 to 24 months. And I wonder if it's because I've only ever had them when we're stuck inside and like stuck in and can't go out and like the, the run around outside as much. Um, and like, I really didn't like, uh, three and a half. Um, and I wonder if it's because we, we're in the winter time and like, yeah, here we come. Yeah. yeah. Cause we're about to come up on four and a half and it's stuck in the inside in the winter time. But, um, yeah, it's just, it, every kid is different and we have, I don't know about year two, but ours are just complete opposites. And if you, if you have a, like a poster child for first child, Joey is it. And if you have a poster child for second child, Johnny is it. And man, so different. <laughs> With you, you were saying you stopped your medication at about five months postpartum. Now, were you nursing the whole time? Did you continue to nurse or how did that work? Because I know the change of hormones then when you wean can spike things up again. Um, That's a good question. Yeah, I did. I nursed both times completely through taking my medication. Um, And both boys, I think I was only on 50 milligrams of Zoloft. So stopping it was, I didn't have any withdrawal. Um, so I think I got lucky there in that stopping my medication was, was easy for me. And then when I stopped nursing, I think I went through a little bit of something but it really wasn't that bad. Wasn't as Um, intense. Yeah. Not as intense. No. So I was actually just talking about this in the last episode, uh, episode number 13 with Jordi Lippy McGraw. And she was saying that she didn't realize that postpartum mood disorders could start up again after weaning or could come out if you never even had them before when weaning due to all the hormone changes. And it's actually something like I see popping its head up every once in a while now because of being home, but also working and like nursing when I'm around or when I'm not um, teaching changes everything around. So it's like those hormones and I'm going, I was doing great for months. What is going on? Why am I getting that like anger again? What is this coming back? And I was like, yes. oh, that's oh. Yeah. So I just wonder, because a lot of the people I've just talked with have content, they've stayed on their medication longer. That's great that you were able to, um, wean off of that and your talk therapy. I know that's always the, the goal is the talk therapy is to really help. So I just wondered how that affected you with, and, and you know what, like if I had stayed on my medications, maybe I would have felt even better. I don't know. Um, but it was one of those things where I felt, I'll tell you exactly how I knew I was ready to stop. I, so Zoloft is an SSRI. So it pumps out serotonin into your brain. And I could, I was very sensitive to that. I could feel it when I first started taking it, I could feel, I could almost feel my brain like zapping serotonin into my body. Like I would get these like zappy, zappy moments. And like, I would get all jazzed up and like, (laughs) Then like when it kicked in, I was like, oh, this is great. Like, awesome. Blah, blah, blah. Um, but I had some, I had maybe the roughest, I don't know. Everybody's experience is different. My experience on the times that I've taken SSRIs is I cannot orgasm, which is 
very sad when you're trying to like find this whole new like relationship with your spouse after children. And I was like, what is wrong with me? This has never been a problem before. And so I know that pumping SSRIs into my body uh, affects me in some negative ways that are, that are, a, that are a trade-off for feeling right. better and not wanting to kill anybody, um, and being able to sleep. Um, but that yeah, is, I thank you for, thank you for sharing that because that's welcome that yeah, tons <laughs> of people don't talk about. And actually it just reminded me of, I don't know. Did you ever watch crazy ex-girlfriend? No. Oh my God. It's amazing. It's totally me because it's all like musical uh-huh. like break out into musical and stuff, but the one, and it's all, it's about mental health and destigmatizing it. And the one thing they're singing about, oh, I can't, I have no libido anymore. We'll just switch to a different drug. (laughs) Yes, it's exactly right. And I, I, and oh, not my favorite thing, but it was temporary and I knew that it was temporary. So we just let it go. But I did know um, that it was time to stop my Zoloft when I didn't feel, I felt sort of flat. Like I could feel, I could get really happy, but I couldn't get sad on, on Zoloft. And I'm, I'm a, I'm a crier. Like I cry like every day, like happy, like happy stuff, sad stuff. Like it's just part of my life. Like if I didn't cry today, did I even actually do anything? Like (laughs) that's kind of how, how I am. And I didn't cry a lot on Zoloft, which was great. Um, in that it was keeping my mood elevated, but I got to a point both times when I was ready to stop that I couldn't get happy and I couldn't get sad. I was just kind of like, and that was how I knew that my body was, there was too much, there was an imbalance of something. So that's when I knew that it was time to stop. So everyone's got a cue. Everyone knows their body. And that was what it was for me. Um, so I don't know, hopefully that helps somebody to sort of like pay attention to what's changing and what's the same and what's right. But yeah, that's great. And when I had interviewed uh, the, di- the psychiatrist, Dr. Silver, that was one of the things we talked about is, you know, we don't just want you to be like cheesy, happy all the time. We want you still to feel feelings, but just exactly. to be able to have that second to manage that emotion. So it's not just like, bam, right there that you can't handle it. Right. Yeah, exactly. It's a good way to put it. To use as a tool. Mm -hmm. So now that we're into our sexual topics, (laughs) you (laughs) have recently shared, and I think this is why you really pursued pre and postnatal um, fitness specialties, uh, with pelvic floor prolapse and anxiety that goes along with that and everything. And I mean, you know, from me five years ago, that was my, like, <laughs> I think you were having a similar trajectory now, five years later. Like, yes. I mean, that's very exactly similar to right. Me. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. So I, so my husband has owned just a gym for six years. Um, and, I've worked out both of my pregnancies, um, fully worked out both of my pregnancies, got back to working out both times, six weeks postpartum. Um, didn't really have an issue after Joey, but after Johnny, I just sort of started having weird experiences, uh, in my life. Um, I was experiencing, um, I wasn't having pain. I wasn't really having discomfort, but I started noticing when I got my cycle back. Um, so nine months postpartum, um, that on the heavy days of my period, I would feel like a heaviness, um, everywhere below the belly button. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just sort of like attributed it to my body is different now. Um, this just feels different. This is just a thing that I'm going to have to deal with. Um, and then, as the natural progression of, uh, me quitting my job and moving to blogging full time, it just sort of became clear to us that me moving into this pre and postnatal fitness certification would be something that would fit beautifully into the gym. It fits 
with our life. It fits with the, the openness that I've always had about my body and like the things that I've been through and, and relying on the village of women who've been through the same thing. Um, so as I started taking these courses, I started learning about pelvic organ, organ prolapse and the gears just kind of like kept turning and like things just kept clicking. And I was like, wait a second. I think that maybe that's why I'm experiencing this thing because I'm also experiencing it, um, after intercourse. So heavy day of my period after intercourse, these are two times where the blood flow is, have, is, is higher and that can exacerbate any kind of dysfunction that's going on inside the mm -hmm. pelvis. Um, so I did, I did, I saw a pelvic, a floor ther physical therapist and I, I was diagnosed with a, a slight prolapse and now I am managing it and doing a great job of having a little bit more comfort in those times. Um, because I know what me, what my personal body is dealing with and how to, how to overcome the discomforts that I was having. So, yeah. And the more I learn about it, the pelvic floor is like directly or can be directly related to anxiety, which is crazy to me, like how much our brains yes. and any kind of like mental dysfunction that we have going on can just completely screw up the rest. Everything. Everything. I, that is, I, re I learned that as well. Um, with not even having any idea that anxiety could cause and pelvic floor dysfunction, it doesn't have to mean prolapse and, right. you know, looseness. It can be too tight. There's the, mm -hmm. you can have that imbalance. And that was something I learned because they thought I, I, I actually had surgery, um, because they thought I, I had endometriosis because of the pain, everything I was having. No, it's because I was a soup up tapers, a hypertonic <laughs> pelvic floor. Yeah. Yeah. So. Wow. That's crazy. And like, so as a pre and postnatal fitness coach, I now am learning that, uh, there's so much more than kegels on the surface. Like oh, yeah. everyone's always been like, Oh, just do your kegels, just do your kegels. Well, what exactly is a kegel? How do I tell someone how to do a kegel? Where should I be feeling a kegel? What's the purpose of a kegel? What is all, what, all this blah, 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 blah. So that's like one, one that's aspect one of women. Right. And then there's women over here who it's too tight. And like, why would I be telling those people to do a kegel when they're already basically doing one all the time? So I am trying to learn how to teach women to go see a pelvic floor physical therapist, go find out what's going on in there. And then let's bring this into the gym so that you can manage this and not be so confused about how to continue your life the way that you'd like to and not feel completely screwed up by having a baby because so much changes when you have a baby, like we've talked about emotionally, mentally, physically, obviously, but more, more so than I think anyone really realizes or knows on their own without someone telling them. Um, so yeah, so we are this pre and postnatal fitness program is specifically for pregnant moms to preserve their postpartum fitness journeys, whatever that is that they'd like to do. Um, and helping women learn how to manage everything that comes with having a baby. Um, because sometimes the, the anxiety and depression is it's slight. And sometimes you don't need medication. Sometimes you don't right. need therapy. Sometimes you just need a group of moms. Who's like, yeah, it sucks. And I've been there and it'll get better. But in the meantime, like let's hug it out or like, let's go for a walk or let's lift some weights or let's do whatever it is that like helps your mind feel better. So I'm specifically geared towards the population who'd like to use fitness as their outlet. Um, and just to be able to do it safely and, and effectively. Yeah. Which, uh, is one of the, yes, there's always needs to be talked about more because I feel it's a education battle more than anything. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So when you saw your pelvic floor physical therapist, did you go because you had learned about it and you knew or did you go and were referred? Because that is something I always find interesting. <laughs> okay. So that's a good question. I went on my own. I did not need a referral. Um, yeah. So if you're in Pennsylvania I, 
I know that's how it works in Pennsylvania because we are both yes um, in PA so right so I was able to so I was learning about this stuff in my courses and I thought okay first of all it would be good for me to build a relationship with pelvic floor physical therapist if I'm going to be in this profession um, and second of all what's going on with me? Cause I want to know too. So I went to my, I went to the appointment. I, they did like a physical like movement thing. Like let's do some squats. Let's do some deadlifts. Let's do some balancing stuff. And like looked for kind of like instabilities and, and dysfunctions in like my muscles and what's mm-hmm. actually going on on the outside of my body. And then, um, did an internal exam and had me do kegels while there was a, an outside stimulus in inside of me feeling what was going on. And I remember, I remember that she asked me to do a kegel and I did one and she's like, uh, are you okay. doing it? Are you doing it? <laughs> yeah. And I had thought like all this time, I thought I was doing them properly. And, and now I know what my body needs to do right in order to do a proper kegel for me. And I know now how to properly do it. And that, yes, I am one of those women that has a, a weak pelvic floor and it's real, and, and it is related to my weak glutes. And even though I am strong, I am a strong person. I'll tell you right now, I'm super strong. I can squat and lift a lot, but <laughs> I still have these little tiny things that I didn't know. And I'm so glad that there are professionals out there who are supposed to be able to tell you these things. And to help you work on them and fix them so that like you can just preserve this body that is the only one you get. And we have, we are in this short window right now where we're done having children and it's probably pretty long ish until we hit menopause that we have this time to like capitalize on this, these bodies that are ours right now, you know, because when we hit menopause, I've heard that that's really horrible. So, you know, so like we got, we have to do all we can do now to, to learn how to manage the the hormones that we have now before they go haywire again. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Um, Oh my gosh. I, I could talk to you about this forever. And Isn't I would that probably... always what happens when you get talking about this stuff? Because yes. we don't, no one talks about it enough. So you're just like, but wait, there's this, but wait, there's this. Right. There's, I could, we could have a whole conversation on all of these little topics. Yes. Um, yes. But I want to thank you so much for taking the time to just give us this brief overview <laughs> of everything. And maybe we'll have to talk more further down the line. I always think of you as a professional writer. Oh, thank you. Did that really (laughs) assist you since you do blog with your anxiety, with postpartum, with kind of dealing with all of what you were dealing with from infertility through having two kids? Uh, no, I, I, and it's so weird. Everybody deals with anxiety differently. Um, I think when you hear this word anxious, you think of like, oh, uh, oh, anxious, anxious, anxious. Like mm-hmm. I need to do this. I need to do this. I need to do this. And I am 100% the opposite. I want to do nothing, talk to nobody. I don't even want to get out of bed. I think I mentioned when I had, after I had Joey, I didn't even want to brush my teeth. It was like, I didn't want to do, I didn't feel like doing anything. And I didn't want to do anything that brought me joy because I felt like, if I was doing something for myself or something that was making me happy, I was forgetting about how awful I should be feeling. And isn't that such a crazy thought? Yeah. But that is what, that's what anxiety does to some people. And, and no blogging was not, I didn't even want to do my job. I, that I, that I love doing. I love writing recipes and baking and taking pictures of it and sharing it with the world. And I didn't even want to do that. And I think that that, that it's important to understand that anxiety can present itself differently in everybody. And I guess you could have put a little bit of the postpartum depression on me, but I didn't, it's so hard to explain how I didn't feel depressed. I did not feel depressed. I felt so anxious and anxiety in me was couldn't sleep, couldn't eat, couldn't talk, couldn't do anything. It was almost as if I was just like paralyzed with anxiety. 
Yeah. I can um, relate to and that. And that's the best way that I, that I can describe it. I think that's another important thing that, again, going back to when I was talking with Dr. Silver, that it is different. It shows up differently in every single person. And as you have shared, other people have shared each time. So it is the most important thing to go and talk to a medical provider to see if you are experiencing that because you can have a mixture of postpartum depression and postpartum anxiety. It's, it's right. called perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, not right. just like one thing. Exactly. Um, so yes, thank you for sharing that your experience was different than what most would think of as the mm-hmm. classical anxiety. Yeah. Another thing that was really hard for me was um, I, I could not sleep, physically could not sleep. And everyone always tells you, just go lay down and take a nap. Right. Do you think I haven't tried? Like, <laughs> do you think I enjoy being this tired? Do you think I enjoy not sleeping at night when my baby is actually sleeping? Do you think that I haven't tried? It was almost as if people would be like, oh, have you tried to take a nap? Right. No. <laughs> I didn't think of that. You're so smart. Oh my God. It drove me nuts. And I know people mean well, but when there's someone who is physically cannot sleep. And I don't know that you can explain to somebody what it's like to physically not be able to sleep until you, you've until ex- you've experienced, experienced it. it. Like you, you are so tired, but your eyes are like, they just, your don't brain wait. just won't shut off. It was horrible. So please don't ever tell a mom who's telling you she can't sleep to just try. <laughs> right. <she> <laughs> Yeah. Oh my. So now going back, what have you done for yourself today as your self care? Oh, today, huh? Or this week, you know? Um, that's a good question. I, so now that we have, so I quit my full-time job a year ago and I've been working for myself since. And every day that I'm able I either go to, I wake up and go to the gym, which is totally something for myself, or I wake up and try to drink my entire cup of coffee before the kids wake up. And, uh, today I did that. So I, man, doesn't coffee taste so much better when there's no kids around? It does. It is incredible. (laughs) Yeah. So I, that my, my daily coffee before the kids are up is, is always my goal. And uh, your realistic self-care. That, that's yes. my big thing. Like, yes. I like that. Yeah. Because realistically, or in a, in a perfect world, I'd love to uh, do many other things, but right. my right. realistic that's self-care. Right. Yeah. I like <laughs> Go that. Go sit in a spa on the beach or something. <laughs> yeah. Yes. That's my self-care, but yeah. Not yeah. Not right. happening. I like that. I'm going to use that from now on. Good one. Okay. <laughs> Um, and then do you have any advice you would go back and give yourself first baby, second baby, um, just as a new mom that you wish you could have known then? Um, ask for help because I, people were offering it and I was turning it down. And even though I didn't want it because I was feeling so awful, the second time when I was feeling better, um, still feeling bad, it was really nice to just have someone come over who would like play with Joey. And while I sat and nursed Johnny or just sat down, (laughs) you know, and, um, I think it was easier for me to accept help the second time because I knew that even if I didn't want that person to be there interacting with me, um, that it was really helpful for Joey. And, and I wish that, uh, if I, if I could tell myself, be a little bit more assertive with what you're feeling and say to people, say, if someone says, Hey, I, can I just come over? Like, I'll hold the baby. You can go take a nap. And I wish that I would have said to more people, listen, I don't really want to interact with anybody, but you're welcome to come over and hold my baby. And I'm just going to leave. Uh, I'm not going to talk to you (laughs) and I'm not going to try to sleep and I'm not going to like take a shower or whatever, because all I want to do is just not be here. And, and I think to that, maybe if someone to be on the other side, if someone says that to you, like say, okay, like I'll just come over and hold your baby and we don't even have to talk. 
And um, so I think, I think maybe to, if I could go back in time, I would just tell myself to be a little bit more honest with myself and the people around me um, and assertive and just say like, this is what I want or what I don't want. And, and just leave it at that. If that makes sense. No, that is perfect. I think you are touching on, I'm getting a theme between everybody who I'm talking to is they ask for help. And, uh, that is definitely a, something that we need to all remember. Yeah. And I hope. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Ask for help, even if you don't want it and be honest, be honest, just say, I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> Right. Assertive, assertiveness. I can be, that's hard for some of us. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. That's tough. Yeah. So actually this, this came up in the membership today as one of the conversations we were having. And I said, we were, you know, COVID comes up a lot because with new moms that has changed the landscape oh of everything. Yes. But it came up and I said, you know what? It actually, even though it wasn't a brand new mom, he, Eli had just turned one, uh, in February. So then March is when everything happened. Uh, it gave me an excuse to say no. Yeah. Like I come from like, well, I always feel like there needs to be an excuse. There needs to be like a conflict. Like, you know, I have something else going on, but I could say no, like we're not doing that or this is not happening, happening right now. And there was a valid reason. So it kind of took it off of me, that guilt. Yeah. And because some, a lot of other new moms right now are experiencing that. Um, so yeah, Yeah, I, I totally agree. Yeah. That's uh, sometimes we feel like we need to give a reason for no, but sometimes the answer is just no. And it's nothing personal. Like, do you want to, can I just come over and hold baby and like bring you something? no, you can't. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) I don't want, I don't want to interact with anybody right now. You can leave it at the step. You can, whatever you have, you can leave it on the, at the door for me. (laughs) That's why I love this, this like dropping it off at the door now with, I know, right. (laughs) This is pretty nice. It's so nice. And you're right. I think that COVID has given us like a reason and the ability to interact with people or not interact with people and to not take it personally. Like if someone's not comfortable being with you, then all right. It's okay. Right. right. Yeah. And, um, totally another off topic. What else do you want to have continue post COVID? I want, um, drive through ordering and coming and bringing it out because I don't want to take two kids out of car seats and then <laughs> press um, them back in. Yeah. I will say that the newborn moms who had, if you had a baby during COVID, you have one really great thing. Everything is exactly the way we wished that it would have been <laughs> when we had babies. Like call Target and they'll just bring it right out to your car and like drive through everything. Like, man, it's so nice. I do hope I I hope that continues. Yes. <laughs> because it's amazing. Yes. <laughs> oh gosh. How should people, if they want to contact you, what's the best way for them to find you? Well, that's a great question because I can offer you uh, goodies or workouts. So (laughs) um, if you're interested, my blog is Fresh April Flowers, like like the ingredient F-L-O-U-R-S, Fresh April Flowers. Um, That's where I do my full-time work, Um, recipes, all that kind of stuff. Um, And then Bent on Better is the name of our gym. And I am specifically Bent on Better Moms on Instagram. Um, and there I just kind of post stuff about motherhood, stuff about prolapse, motherhood in general. So yeah, depends what you want from me. You can get two different, two different parts of me, or if you want it all, I'm happy to talk to you anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will link to, um, your social media and everything in the show notes, cool. but I want to just thank you so much. This has been wonderful. And again, I mean, we could chat, I could chat with you forever, but <laughs> know, right? seriously. Yeah. Thank you, Tori, for, for doing this interview and just doing this in general. Um, I think it's, I think it's really great to talk to all kinds of moms from all different walks of life with different numbers of children and different situations that, that no cookie cutter for this kind of stuff. And Right. And the more, the more we talk about it, the more we can recognize these things Thank in, you, Lynn, in ourselves, for your which, story is, which is empowering. Yeah, for sure. We, we really love it a lot. 
Are you looking for a little help in finding ways to get your mindset back and find yourself again after becoming a mom? Are you looking for ways to exercise safely postpartum? Well, pre and postnatal exercise are my specialty. And I, with my background in psychology, I am here to help you with your mindset. At the same time, When you are ready to join the Momxiety Club membership, where you'll have access to a supportive community and workouts to help you calm your momxiety, or work with me one-on-one on on movement and mindset for mom, you can head to join.momxietyclub.com. There at join.momxietyclub.com, you'll also find some free downloads about pre and postpartum fitness, as well as helping new moms from afar. This is a great thing you could give to some of your friends who want to know how they can help you. At the end of each episode, you hear about that week's guests' realistic self-care and what they've done for themselves. Uh, My body this past week has been really needing to move and with the weather being nice here in the Northeast the past few days at the mid to end of October, I wanted to take advantage of it. So after dropping off my oldest at school, we took a nice long walk today and while it's Wednesday while I'm recording this, Wednesdays are generally my busiest days for teaching one-on-one clients, teaching online, and getting make sh- making sure the podcast is all ready for you. I make sure to schedule Momxiety Club memberships, online mom mommy bar live class on Wednesdays so that I know I have a physical time to connect with other moms and teach and exercise and get a nice boost to my mood to get me going through the rest of the day. So those were my two realistic self-care things that I did for myself today. Now is the time that I get to ask you what your realistic self-care for the day or week looks like. Share what you've done for yourself or share what you identified with from today's episode by tagging at Momxiety Club and using the hashtag realistic self care. You can also send me a message at Momxiety Club on Instagram and Facebook. And you can also leave a voicemail if you want to hear yourself on a future episode. Go to join.momxietyclub.com and that's M O M X I E T Y Club and click on the send voicemail button so you can have a little bit of the spotlight on a future episode. I want you to hear other moms' stories and to help you share your story with other moms so we all don't feel so alone in our motherhood journeys. And with that, that is the end of today's episode. I know it was a long one. Thank you for hanging in with me, but as I interview more and more moms, there is just so much to tell in such little time. Can I ask you to share this with a mom friend to help them out? That's how we can help each other and how we can get rid of this anxiety together. And remember to hit subscribe so you get the next episode automatically wherever you listen to your podcasts. Have a good one, mama. The Momxiety Club podcast is not intended to take place of medical advice or therapy. If you are in crisis, call your local emergency number or the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK.